So thank you everybody for coming to this first technical working group on NAPTAN. I'm really pleased we've got such a good attendance. Um, we've been working on NAPTAN at DFT, um, perhaps behind the scenes a little bit for the last sort of few months. Um, and we're getting to the point now where we can't really get it any further without coming to talk to, to this group and really get your input in, and helping to shape how we do things. So this is a technical working group, but we are going to kick off with a little bit of stuff around just what we've been doing just to, to fill in the gaps. Um, I've put an agenda out. I'm going to share some slides in a second. We are going to we put the meeting for two hours. Um, I think uh, we'll see how it goes. We haven't done this before, so if we take the two full hours, then fine. Um, but if we are looking like we're going to do that, I'll suggest that we take a break for five, ten minutes on the hour, just so that we can all have a bit of a refresh. Um, we can't see the chat, so I was going to say if you've got, I want this to be a conversation rather than a broadcast. So do interrupt us or put your hand up or uh, use the chat. If you do use the chat, then somebody else might have to ask us the question if we can't see it or, or we'll, mm. we'll see how that happens. But um, let's have more of a conversation rather than a broadcast. Um, and I guess this might not work. It's a bit of a trial. We haven't done this before. We might need to split into smaller groups and do something different or, or look at different approaches. So at, at the end of the session, if you want to give me feedback or send feedback afterwards, you can always contact me through my email address or through the NAPTAN inbox or any other way. Uh, through Tim or whatever you need to do. Uh, but yeah, give us some feedback on how you think this has gone and what we might need to do differently to make sure that we, we're working with you in the right way. I think that'd be really helpful. Um, so before we get into, and, and whilst I um, just start the um, slide share, we're just gonna, we wanna do some introductions because you all know each other. We don't know any of you, and this might be slightly painful, but it'd be really great if we um, could do that. And I think Jay has offered to to lead this part for me while I sort out the slides. Um, so over to Jay. Oh, actually, can I just go first? Because my name's Adrian Falconer and I'm a senior de delivery manager at the Department of Transport. Forgot that important bit. And I'm I'm sort of leading on the on the NAPTAN redevelopment. Over to you, Jay. So Adrian, you already yes. missed two pieces out that you needed to say. We also need to know your pronoun because today is International Pronouns Day, so we are going to do pronouns. Um, but also, what's your favourite bus route? Because we're all anoraks about bus routes. So I want everyone to give their name, their pronoun, their organisation, what they do, and tell us about your favourite bus route, just okay. in a sentence. In a very quick sentence, yeah. So my favourite bus route is the G1, uh, which goes everywhere in South London. Over to you, Jay. Oh, and he. Right. And he. Right. Um, very quickly, I'm Dr. Jay. I use they as a pronoun. I work for ThoughtWorks as a consultant. I'm a, I got to give myself a job title, so I got Harbinger of Change, because why not be fabulous if you get to make up your own job title? Um, I'm a service designer business analyst type person um, and my favourite bus, I'm working for DFT on the NAPTAN project and my favourite bus route is the 176 because it goes from work or the Soho office for uh, ThoughtWorks basically to outside my house in Elephant and Castle and I get to go across Waterloo Bridge which is wonderful when you're not from London because every time I look out it reminds me that I'm in London. Um, so I'm just going to go through the participants list and call people out because there's no use pointing because nobody will ever know who I'm pointing to. <laughs> so, Adrian, do you want to run back through the rest of the slide deck? You might be on mute if you're talking. Thanks, Ben. Somebody had to do that. I'm glad it was me. Um, <laughs> apologies. Um, can you see my screen OK? Yeah, we can. OK, good. It was really helpful just to hear it, but thank you for going through that. It's really nice for us to know who we're dealing with. I think there's quite a different mix of job descriptions that we've been talking about there. And I think that just goes to my earlier comment about we're going to try and do some stuff um, this this morning. Um, we might not have everybody, you know, all the right people in the room and we might have to think about how we do that differently. I'm really keen that we do two things. One, that we keep you informed of what's happening with the redevelopment work on NAPTAN and, and get your input. And also um, we do delve into some of the technical things and it might be that we, we you know, we set up a, a different group to look at the technical stuff, but let's see where we get to. Um, so in terms of ways of working, just a few things we wanted to let you know um, about how we think this is going to work uh, and how we're working, just so you can understand uh, why we're doing what we're doing, because sometimes I can be a bit odd in how it does things. Um, so. We're here to get your views. This is like an opportunity for us to have a you know, discussion and to hear what's important to you and what things you should be working on to help us work out where our priorities need to be. 
Um, so we want to have a two-way conversation about this uh, and get your feedback in whatever way we can. So either via this group or via PTIC or by an email, or if you want to have a chat with us, then please do. Um, and we, we want to use this as an opportunity to test our ideas. So we're going to come to this group, or the idea being that we come to this group with, well, we've been thinking that this is what we need to do, um, but what do you think about it? So we haven't made any decisions yet. And this is the process by which we want to start to make decisions so that we're involving everybody in that process um, before we commit to building something that could cost money and be you know, in, 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 in live for a number of years, for example. Um, I would ask as well, not huge amounts of us are transport specialists. So just bear that in mind. We are we are learning, we're, we're, you know, we're quick learners and we're doing what we can to get up to speed. But you probably, there's probably an, an asymmetry of information at the moment and we're working on that. But um, you might just need to be patient from time to time if we don't quite understand the connections between TransExchange, Siri, NetX, et cetera, et cetera. So just, just bear with us. Um, in terms of how we're working, you might be familiar with this, but this is the sort of government service design, service delivery life cycle. Um, we've been doing a discovery, um, which Ursula's going to talk to you about very briefly in a moment. Um, we are currently in what we call an alpha phase where we're looking to just build some prototypes of a system and to really un you know, uncover the nuts and bolts of, of what's going on and what we think we might want to build when we look to build something that's actually going to be released. And we're hoping to finish this stage at the end of, end of the year. Um, and then um, so following on from that, we are looking to do some sort of a private beta, which would be we're going to take the best idea that we've got and actually build that. And at some point in between the end of the year and early next year, we will be looking for people to come and work with us and actually test the things that we're doing before we actually try and release it at any sort of bigger scale. So that is some that is a way that we want to work. And we're hoping that some of you will, will come forward and, and, and volunteer to work with us on that basis. Um, Adrian, Adrian, are you able to share the results of the discovery or are they already published somewhere? Um, we did actually publish something, but we would be happy to. Um, we've got a slightly tidied up version, actually, which we could send around with the minutes of this meeting if that would help. Yeah. Great. Um, cool. No problem. Uh, final thing from me before I hand over to Ursula. Um, we're very much focused on the Naptan rebuild. Um, I know there's lots of things going on at the moment with bus open data and um, we've recently put out the open Naptan quality tool and there are ongoing things with the existing service which is becoming increasingly hard to maintain by the way so please bear with us on that. Um, we're happy to talk about any of those things with you but this group of people that have come to this meeting is specifically focused on the rebuild um, and are knowledgeable on that and perhaps slightly less knowledgeable on the other things so if you um, Need to need to speak to somebody on the other things. We're happy to put in put you in touch with them. You, with the people who are working on them, you probably all already are. I know Ursalan is, is a, and James are across quite a lot of these things anyway. Um, but if we could just focus in these sessions on, on the rebuild, that would be really helpful. Okay, I'm going to ask has anyone got any questions at this point before I hand over to to Ursalan to talk about what we're aiming to do and what progress we've made. Thank you. No more questions. I will pass on to Ursula to talk about what Thank we've been you. doing. Thank you, Ursula. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, just to start off, uh, we know that Naptan is really important. Uh, every time you're using a journey planner, you're using something based on Naptan data. Uh, so and from the, the DFT point of view, we also understood that the transport sector is changing, new modes are appearing. Uh, but what was important for us is that uh, someone based on their personal circumstances and preference can complete the journey. Uh, we want Naptan to stay useful and to do this it needs to adapt. Uh, so we started an internal discovery in the beginning of May for six weeks. This was a collaboration between different teams within DFT to ensure that all angles were covered from policy, technology and data. Uh, one of the during this time, the team did a lot of good work to understand the user journeys, uh, the user needs, and how they interact with the Naptan service. Uh, in discovery, we identified that the technology behind Naptan was one of the barriers for us. Uh, it was really old and it has been built over twice without any documentation or real understanding uh, on how the actual system worked. 
uh, we were out of date and even though we are provided with accessibility data, we couldn't do anything with it. Uh, so we have assessed and then uh, from an internal point of view, we assessed a migration to a new uh, cloud service, which was not feasible. Uh, so we made the decision this service needs to be rebuilt completely. Uh, we also identified that the web content and the accessibility uh, needs to be consolidated. Uh, needs to be consolidated, um, as well as the documentation around the technical landscape of Naptan needs to be reviewed as well. Uh, so these were our findings from discovery, uh, which was done internally. Adrian, if we could just go to the next slide. So what have we achieved in the last few months? So we knew the laptop Naptan is a live service and we had to ensure that we continue to support the ongoing maintenance of the service uh, as well as rebuilding it. So immediately one of the first things we did was to address any high risk security issues and, and this was mainly internal for internally focused uh, things that we had to work on. Um, we also implemented a former support model. Uh, so this was bringing the right teams together, so such as the data unit uh, and the developers in, within DFT. Uh, and most importantly, we had to ensure that the Naptan app and the content that's available, it's accessible and in line with the legislation that kicked in in September. So those are the, some of the things that we've achieved in the last few months. Uh, Going forward, uh, we are looking at uh, one of the key uh, gaps that we've identified was uh, an overall Naptan strategy uh, to tie in all the work that's related to Naptan. Uh, so what we what we what we're doing right now is uh, we bought in our a technical partner uh, ThoughtWorks to help us achieve that. Uh, we are another reason to bring in uh, some external expertise is to uh, upscale the DFT development team as well to support the service. So we are in the medium to long term, uh, we are looking to rebuild the existing Napton service in line with our data and technology strategies. Uh, we want to ensure that the capabilities are in place to maintain and support the new service and it's flexible enough to adapt with anything new that the industry produces, whether that's NetEx or anything that sort of comes after that. Um, so yes, this is some of the work that we've done. Hopefully uh, people who've used the Naptan service might have seen these changes. Uh, on regards to the web content, that was uh, splashed over all Four different websites. Uh, it was old and contradictory. Uh, uh, so what we've done is we've redrafted the content to give it a new look and feel. Uh, we've removed uh, one website already and we're shortly in the process of closing the final legacy website. So uh, just to summarize where we are since the last PTIC meeting. So as, as mentioned, we've uh, implemented performance and security improvements. Uh, just to ensure that the service as is is useful for uh, the people who are using. Uh, we've ensured uh, the compliance with accessibility legislation and improved Naptan, Naptan web, web content. Uh, and uh, bringing in ThoughtWorks, we've already started working on initial prototypes of the new Naptan service. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's where we are. Is there anything on the next slide, Adrian? Oh, we've got so, two for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, our aims for the next three months is to collaborate with ThoughtWorks uh, and prototype and test a new version of Naptan service. Uh, and I think another reason for bringing in ThoughtWorks is to upscale the DFT development team as well in order to support the service. Um, and I think the one of the key pieces of work for us is to have an overall Naptan strategy to tie in different Naptan work streams, such as the open Naptan uh, and the Naptan rebuild, the life service. And there is also dependencies with other uh, transport related services like the bus open data. So the, I think an overall strategy is needed, uh, which needs to be a collaboration between DFT and the industry experts. Uh, so that's our aims for the next few months. Uh, 
And we're really looking forward uh, for your contribution in achieving all those three things. Cool. So I'm going to break now just for any more questions. Uh, and then if not, we'll go to the three, the three, well, first of the three topics that we wanted to discuss today. Has anyone got anything at this point? Um, only one note from me. Unfortunately, I've got a deployment. I'm going to jump off for 10 minutes and be back. So if I miss anything, apologies. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, so either Ding. we've wowed you to sleep or we've answered all the questions. <laughs> it's one or the other. And I'll go with That's fine. We can safely move on. <laughs> I think in terms, of, in terms of the rest of the session, so we've got three topics that we want to discuss. I suggest we have a go at discussing one of them and seeing where we get to. Um, and then potentially after that, we'll have a break and come back and do the next two. Um, I can't see if there's a hand up because I'm presenting, which is one of the joys of Teams. So if somebody has put their hand up to raise a question, somebody else will need to shout out. Um, and for that reason, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Um, Jay is going to talk to us about the joys of file transfers and transferring <laughs> information, at which point I gladly stop talking and hand over. I love this. You give they give the most technical screen to the least technical person on the team. Um, so if I can understand this, everyone can understand this is kind of how we've got. So what I wanted to do was just run through these couple of acronyms and that that's being thrown around a lot just to make sure that we're all on the same page. We've all got the same understanding and um, there is nobody uh, less technical than me, really. I spend most of my day drawing stick figures, and you'll get to see some of those in a minute. So um, I'm not the person who is an expert on this. So F F FTP, which is what you're using now, um, is not secure. The way that it shares your username and password is unencrypted, which means that anyone can kind of see the details. They can take those and use them and do what they want. And I believe this causes a number of concerns um, for people who are uploading data because your your IT people are saying, do not use this. It's, it's too insecure and it's really bad. We understand that. So we just wanted to make sure that FTP we all understood what FTP is, what we're using now. Um, there's two types of security that we can put on FTP. And I'm sorry about the acronyms. People less people have no sense when they make these acronyms. So FTPS is called FTP secure. So what this does is, as far as I understand, is when you send the information through FTP, the same protocol, the same everything, it does a little bit of extra work and encrypts the data so it can't be read as easily. That's all that it does. It's not, it's it's almost as old as FTP. It's not that much more secure. It's more secure, but not as much more secure. And then the next one is called SFTP. And this is called, or SSH FTP. SSH stands for Secure Shell. I don't know why an H has suddenly appeared, um, but apparently SSFTP would not have been a good acronym. Um, and this has been built with security in from the bottom up. So this uses Secure Shell, which is what we use to connect to servers, to get information from them, to do command line, code liney stuff with them. We use SSH, SSH, SSH. put my teeth back in, and SS, SFTP uses that protocol to send files, to connect up to the server and to send and receive files. So it's much more secure. If we move to that, your IT people will love us. That's, that's the three different types of FTP that we're talking about. Does this make sense to everybody? Are there any questions? And if there's anything more technical, I'm going to ask Ben to help me out. Doesn't look like it. Looks like you're safe, Excellent. Jay. I'm, I'm really pleased that I'm safe. So the next three I'm just going to touch on in a really super light way is um, what's the difference between an API, an XML, and a JSON file? And it's called a JSON. I, the A suddenly appears when you try to say it. So an API is a way for two computers to talk to each other. 
It's just a protocol that says, I'm going to send you information and I'm go if you want information back, I'm going to send it this way. And one of the fun things of APIs that I've discovered is when you make a request for information, you can say, um, I last got information from you on this date, send me everything that's changed between this date and now. So one of the advantages of it, of, of APIs, is you can send only the updated information or you can download only updated information because the computers go, oh yeah, I know what you sent last time or you sent it, you last sent it on the state, so only I'll only send me the stuff from the state onwards. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a smarter way of sharing information between computers. And so that's what an API is, as far as I understand, and an XML and JSON are just the languages that they use. So XML is what we use currently for um, NAP10, and it is a beast. And JSON is also a beast, and it is not a language that we use currently. And they're both able to, uh, they're both just different languages that can go into the computer or into the server, and the server can go, okay, I know what kind of file this is, and I can understand it, and, and build or take the data or store the data or store the file. Does that explanation make sense to everybody? And is there anything else you'd like me to attempt to explain that's technical information that we need to know here? I, I know Adrian's shaking, shaking his head, something. but I'm just, yes. Uh, so CSV is how we take data at the moment. A CSV, yep. And that's not on that list. Oh, sorry, I should have put that on. So a CSV file is is a comma separated values and it is a way of extracting data from the database um, as a text file. So it's the smallest, simplest way of sending data as far as I understand. So it it almost looks like an Excel spreadsheet. It's got the columns across the top and then a whole pile of information separated by commas and it does interesting things with the commas as to um, so that something like Excel or whatever program you're using can understand what's a column heading and what's the data inside it. Did that make sense, Dan? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Excellent. And I will, before we send this out, I will add CSV to that. Um, I'm just making myself a little note. Add CSV to slide 13. Shall I move on to 14? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what I wanted to explain with this wonderfully, you get to see my handwriting and 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 everything on this slide is how we're conceptualizing NAPTAN. So we did an exercise with all of the people who worked on NAPTAN and we did a kind of what metaphors can we use? Because by talking in metaphors, don't worry, Adrian, I'm not going to get into underwater bees and NAPTAN fishes and all kind of weird things. We're going to stick at the high level. Um, but we got on to talking about metaphors, which allows us to allowed us to explore how we all thought about NAPTAN and what we thought it could be. And we came up with four concepts that are we felt were, in, were integral to what NAPTAN is and what it could be. Um, because it's a very hidden system, it, it is the thing that everything runs on. So what we wanted to look at was what NAPTAN should be inside of that system. So we came up with this idea that NAPTAN is collective. It's, it's owned collectively because it serves a pile of things. So it's very collective in the way that it thinks in the way that it runs and the way that we think about it. It's dynamic. It can change as things change and um, the information coming in and the information going out can change. It's modular so that we can swap things in and improve things piece by piece. We're not having to improve the whole thing at a time and it can self-heal, self-correct. So this is much more about if we know that stuff coming in needs a little bit of work, we can sort this out. We can make this we can make this work out. So with that, we came up and with our concepts, we came up with this concept of these like beehive um, or hexagons of like a honeycomb and things like that. And we got into some weird areas on our metaphors, which I'm not going to go into now. The core thing that we came to is that we should be able to ingest any schema that you want to give us, and we should be able to put out any schema. 
that somebody wants to request. Now, the, the, the ingest could be something like an XML or an API, um, which is the APIs in the baby files. And the, the output could be as XML, could be a CSV, or could be as an API. So that's how we kind of wanted to think of the concept overall. And this is what we're kind of testing. If we have this concept, is that technically possible? And that's what we're playing. I'm saying playing. That's what we're testing with in the in the alpha. Can we do some of this stuff? What are the limitations? What would what would it take to make some of the stuff happen? Um, and I think here is a good place to pause and get your feedback on this concept, on this conceptual idea of what NAPTAN could be. And does that meet your notions of what NAPTAN is? Can I just ask, well, sorry, um, I, I'm, not, I'm a little bit unclear. Are, are you talking about changing the, the, the actual backend database that forms NAPTAN or, or just the interfaces into it? Or am I? Uh, I'm going to defer to Ben because Ben's the more technical of the two of us. As far as I understand, we're making it from scratch, but Ben's got, Ben can explain that better. It's all up for grabs. Basically, yeah. Um, so, so how the data is stored centrally, um, how DFT store that data, um, may change. Um, and what we want, to, what we'll end up doing over the next few weeks is we'll end up analysing the data, the sorts of relationships that that data has with each other, the fields in there, and whatnot. And we're going to try and make a a good guess um, at how that data should be stored within DFT in order to provide. Um, these these kind of access layers so that so that you can access the data in whatever format you need to access the data in. Right. Does that, does that, does that make yeah, sense? So that, that question. But, but the field the fields will remain the same in Naptan. That nothing changes there. It's just it's just the 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 um the format behind the scenes and possibly the interfaces into it are all um subject to change to make it compatible modern um, requirements is, is is that right um so yeah so the fit so the field wouldn't change right um the things currently being required to be uploaded are like there, there's very specific standards for the xml files that, that you currently that local authorities currently upload they won't change um we may add on new standards that we can accept um at some point further down the line that 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 i think is part of what we'd like to discuss at one of these at some point um, and the way that we take data out um, also first of all won't change the way you take the data out today um, should still work tomorrow <laughs> um, but we may add additional ways additional interfaces to take that data out in different ways and different formats i mean it's a good point to test isn't it because we've been okay. from the research that we've done um we get the impression that there's a, there's a, there might be a degree of fragility in the ecosystem out there and we don't want to make any changes that really disrupt and make things difficult for people. Um, it'd be good to hear if that's true or if no, everyone's just, we're, we're holding everybody up and we just need to get on with it. Um, it'd be good to hear some views on that perhaps. Well, certainly I'm aware of it. There's been an issue with um, sort of downloading CSV um, mm -hmm. outputs from, from the NAPTAN database. I think there's a new there's a new sort of interface that's sort of user friendly where you you sort of specify it on the screen and I don't think that's been working whereas there's there's an old um sort of interface or website where where you do it by sort of specifying a URL where you sort of um specify the areas you want separated by like a pipe symbol and that still works so I think what I'd caution is don't remove any of the interfaces until you've gone through a sort of transition stage of uh, um, making sure the new stuff works and everyone's been informed about it because I think the, there might be also I know certainly in Leicester the VICs have got like little um, programs that that use the existing uh, interfaces to sort of download a whole load of NAPT sort of mm -hmm. seamlessly and an executable so if that suddenly disappeared obviously that would stop working um, and I imagine there's perhaps that kind of thing all over the place so yeah i mean it's one of the difficulties we've had with the support is we needed to change the look and feel of the site just so that it met with accessibility 
rules. In doing that, it's opened up a whole can of worms, stuff that we thought was working but hadn't worked for six years, um, so, you know, all sorts of issues like that. All we did was change the look and feel, but somehow we've uncovered lots of broken bits of functionality. So we haven't, in theory, we, ha we weren't trying to change any of the functionality or any of the things that you could currently do on NAPTAN. We just wanted to change what it looked like. Possibly that has caused problems, possibly the problems were always there, but we just didn't know about them. Um, what I guess what we're saying with the redevelopment is we we will because the, the other system is so old we, we just can't do anything with it so we will have to build it from scratch rebuild it from scratch and to do that we need to learn all the things that you're doing and how you're interacting with it so that we can bring everyone with us and we don't lose anything like you say because that's the last thing that we want to do is is make problems for people and stop you from being able to do something that you've been doing for you know numbers of years yeah okay all right thank, thank you Is is so? Here's a question for everybody: Is stability of the system your main concern, or is the ability to put up accessibility data a bigger concern, which would which would lead into a a, a payoff? Jared, um, hello. Yeah, it, it's a very good question. I mean, certainly. You know, efficiency of, I mean, I'm uploading, so I'm not tending to download uh, files from that time, although my colleagues are. So I think in, in that case, sort of efficiency and reliability is absolutely crucial. And the portal's normally been quite reliable up to now, although a while back it wasn't. But I think, to be honest with you, accessibility, and I'm not quite sure, I'm, it's not a question of blaming anyone, but you've asked the question. Accessibility information, from what I'm seeing on that time, leaves a lot to be desired. Um, and so if that's blunt, and I don't know if that's down to the, the system's ab ability to actually accommodate it, I think it may well be, or actually the lack of a sort of a, a data collection standard, which I think is probably more down to, and I include London most certainly, the sort of uh, arrangements for that, because it is time consuming. Mm -hmm. but I think the, the accessibility, I think, is a is a very very strong is a very sort of key weakness maybe even beyond the scope of what we're talking about and i think that we really do need to i think we, we talked about accessibility in terms of i presume the sort of usability of files but i think accessibility in terms of whether a bus stop is accessible or not is an absolutely crucial thing that there really does need to be urgent attention paid to yeah so so just to be clear um, we're talking about accessibility information being able to be downloaded from NAPTAN when we're talking accessibility in this context. The accessibility of the website, to me, is something that we need to do, but that's a lesser concern than me as a NAPTAN user being able to download the accessibility information that my customers who have accessibility needs require. I think it'd be really interesting to perhaps have if we have a future session just on accessibility data, because my understanding is that that type of information is held in schema version 2.5, which we've never been able to accept and therefore never been able to export. So we've never been able to make that information available. But one of the questions we have is if we could import a version 2.5, are people ready to send it to us? Because we don't know. Uh, but also, I think to your point, uh, um, is is that information enough? Is that the right information of other people? Do, is there a better standard out there that actually we we should really be looking at? Which I think is it's a, that's when Ursuline talks about the strategy in the future. Maybe that's not in the next three to six months, but that's certainly we need to be thinking about how we might deal with that so that we don't build something now that precludes that from happening in the future. Nick, you had your hand up. Nick Carey. Thank you. Yes. Um, you hinted earlier that one advantage of an API can be that it, it can act in a restful way, i.e. you can query it and only get back new stuff if that's all that you need. Um, you haven't so far mentioned whether or not it will be possible to query parts of the data because your choice of functionality and how the thing works and your choice of technology and how you build this uh, will be influenced by um, what I think, I hope and expect would be 
a tremendous utility for people. One, on the one hand, they only need to upload the bits that they're adding. Number two, they should only be able to get access to the data that they need, and not this big Python-like dinner uh, lump of a file. <laughs> um, and and a very different sort of question, but there's a hell of a lot of errors in NAPTAN. Um, and not much error checking or validation. If it's a valid XML file, it seems to be able to be uploaded. Uh, are you going to address the issue of um, getting people to avoid putting their stops in the North Sea, uh, which I believe is at the moment a method that people use for archiving their stops because uh, they don't want to get rid of them, <laughs> so they just stick them in the North Sea. Um, um. <laughs> So, so Nicholas, I can say as an as, as a day as somebody having to um, do some of the data analysis. Uh, yes, we will be tackling some of that. So we're looking at um, trying to understand how many bus stops there are in the North Sea and why they've been put there, um, but also understanding um, how best we can check the information how we can quality check the information. For, for me as a service designer, understanding why people were putting bus stops in the North Sea is, is really important because it's understanding. People weren't doing that um, just because they wanted to do it. They were doing that to work around something. So it's yeah, understanding correct. what that work around was for and how can we provide that service within the system. So that's a really key point that I'm totally happy to have a conversation on me and Kerry, uh, or me and Corey and who, and some of the other analysts to sit down and work with people as to why, why that, what they were doing to work around to make that work, if that made sense. Um, because the North Sea is, and this will lead to some validation that we're trying to look at. Um, so we're trying to figure out what is what is the right validation to put in. If you try to put a bus stop in the North in the North Sea, if you try to put a bus stop accidentally not on land, should we tell you? Exactly. Um, H historically, uh, dealing with that time because it was purely through a, 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 a uh, an upload interface was like uh, posting cigarette papers under a un, under a prison cell door. Um, <laughs> something more interactive. Uh, which gives users functions that, you know, validation, checking, change, um, ability to visually through our, G our GIS interface actually see what they're doing um, and display to them when they've produced a spider's web instead of a sequence of stops and stuff like that could be terribly helpful. That does so sound terribly, terribly useful, Nick. Yeah, terribly I think there's... Useful. There's two really interesting topics there that perhaps we could pick up at subsequent groups in terms of data quality. I mean, I've certainly got questions. I think there's something like 6,000 stops that have got an app core code that doesn't meet the validation rules. And the question for us is, well, what do we do with that in the future? Do we look to uh, amend the incorrect values or do we just continue to allow the incorrect values to be there? Um, and that's a decision, the conversation that we need to have together, I think, about how do we do that without negatively impacting on 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 you, but at the same time, obviously trying to improve the data quality and working out what's important to us. I, I think it'd be good to get some, if anyone's got any specific views on actually no, none of us really want to send a 2.1, so don't worry about that. You know, we're all moving to 2.4 or we're never going to do a 2.5, so don't worry about building that or, or anywhere in between those extreme extremities of views that would be helpful to get a steer on that. Yeah. Um, Tony Brown, you've had your hand up for a while. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see because I'm presenting. I need to get the different yeah. presenter mode. That's no problem. Um, sorry, it was just really quickly on the subject of North Sea, but the moment's kind of gone now anyway. But it's okay. <laughs> um, you might find that it was kind of limitations of the software people used. I know in Essex, um, we used a piece of software where you couldn't make, but you couldn't unshow historical stops basically that had been used previously in your software. So obviously, the North Sea was kind of like your graveyard. Um, it could be that authorities up and down the country um, have either put them in the East North Sea or, you know, anywhere else, Bristol Channel, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I certainly think it, it, they should go through. Um, I think we've credited ours now in Essex, but that was a, that was a reason why we were doing it. My big worry would be the ones that are harder to find, like like if you've decided to archive them by putting them all outside Town Hall. Yeah, exactly. Because obviously when, 
as a person you look at the data and you go well that's not that many bus stops are there so you're like you'll know that locally but somebody downloading it won't necessarily even spot that when they say it um yeah another one is kind of like bus stations that become defunct and you don't really want you want you not necessarily hope that one day that bus station reopens and you leave them in but really um you know you could call time on them kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah so is this um just to ask a question that may be driving slightly towards solution but is this the requirement almost to have an archive function within the data to say this bus stop please keep the data but it is not a published data so it would sit in NAPTAN but would not but would maybe not be pushed out into the output schemas that's just an interesting question to ask unless somebody explicitly said show me all of the bus stops including the archived ones so Jay transit um, NAPTAN does support archiving of stops um, and so you can say it's not used anymore. Uh, it's important to retain those because if you're wanting to do historical analysis against an old bus route data set, which um, some tools uh, allow you to do, um, so you don't want to get rid of that data. The problem is a lot of or a number of systems out there don't support archive or if you mark it as archive as uh, uh, as you just heard, it doesn't then remove it from the map. So when you're trying to build a bus route using, um, you know, clicking on bus stops as you go along the route, you can still see the archive ones. Um, so oh. some of it, some of it's the software, but it's technically supported in the standards. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. So, so um, I think one of my questions, sorry to dive in a little bit, but one of the questions would be, let's have a look at the software that's causing some of those issues and how we can help them address it as well. If, if they need an API or something like that is going to help them handle these archive stops. Yeah. So that we don't have bus stops in the middle of the North Sea. Uh, I think somebody else has their hand up and yeah, I can't Dan, see it either. Dan Saunders. Hi, yeah, thank you. So it kind of follows on nicely to what you're talking about at the moment. So I think uh, whether input you take, you have a consistency in the output. So if, you want, if, if for example, accessibility stuff is really important, you're going to get in 2.5, then anyone that submits in 2.1, you've not got a consistent output for everybody as part of it. And the same for archiving of stops and information like that. You know, if you're using the delete flag or the pending flag that you've got in NAPTAN at the moment, you need to have a consistent approach. That's the way that everyone does it across the board. If you have someone in Essex that does it one way, someone in Leicester does it a completely different way. Us as a downstream user, we find that really hard because we're not mind readers of knowing how actually it's been done and how it's been provided as an output. And you know, we, when we produce the TNDS and we do the NCSD, we, one of our checks we do is we look for the flag of the NAPTAN. Is it pending or is it deleted? And we flag that out as, a, as an error message. Uh, but, you know, we, can, we only can report that if it's done consistently across the board is my kind of comment on that. And I really like uh, Nick's idea of some sort of GIS interface web tool that you could use to input this data because then you get that consistent approach of required fields and things like that. And that then gets that consistent consistency that's so important. Um, Dan, can I ask your help here just for a second? You you did some acronyms really fast at me, T, T and DS and NCSD. Yep. Bearing in mind that I have no knowledge whatsoever of buses other than as a user of buses, um, could you quickly run me past what those two mean Certainly. just so, so that we're all on the same page? So TNDS is a travel line national data set. This has been run since 2011. That is the... Uh, weekly open data build of public transport timetables for Great Britain. So that goes out and that's uh, what was there before BOD. I think will continue to run in the future. This is what all the journey planners use at the moment to plan uh, bus routes. So we take in trans exchange and process that. Um, and an NCSD is a contract we've got directly to depart for transport, which is exactly the same, but not quite as sexy, but for uh, national coach services. So that's the same stuff, but for all the national express coaches, mega bus coaches, new Barrett coaches, and people like that. So again, we process this data and then put out into into open data. Thank you so much. That's that's really useful for me. Um, and you use NAPTAN. So just making sure that I understand how NAPTAN fits in with your world. You use NAPTAN to make sure that you know where the posts are and where people can wave to a bus. Yeah, exactly. So we, we need to know exactly um, for a journey planner, you say where you can get on that bus effectively. And that's where the NAPTAN information is key. And that's why Perfect. accurate and consistent 
is, is, is also key. Fantastic. That, that, that really helps. Um, Shall we take a five? I'm going to be Adrian and just say, should we take a quick five minute break? And then we've got a couple more questions to run through. If there's nothing more on that particular one, Mike, I see that your hands up again. Oh, oh not again. I see your hands up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say. Um, are we talking about tools to, to help with management of NAPTAM? Because there are there are things like tools by passenger uh, and ITO World uh, that that will map NAPTAN and, and are very useful in terms of just visualising what's there. I presume that they are well known amongst all the people here. But I guess what you're talking about here is 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 some kind of interface that enables you to manage the NAPTAN things as you're uploading them. Because at the moment the tools are just retrospective, aren't they? You upload it and then you can look at what you've see what it what it amounts to whether it's in the north sea whether the data you put in is wrong i presume you're talking about a, a, a gis based system or, or some kind of interface that's a lot more user friendly that enables it to be um got right first time when you're doing when you're doing the job of uploading it rather than sort of retrospectively is is, is that right or, or have i missed something um that sounds a, to me that sounds a fascinating way of approaching it um i really like it in terms of validation not just in the back end doing a validation but also asking person's eyeballs and brain to double check what they're putting i think in. that's what nick might have been saying when he was talking about a gis based system um I, I may i may have misunderstood what he he means but that's that's how it came across to me anyway it, it's what i meant um, these systems are out there, obviously. There's lots of suppliers that have solutions which they sell to local authorities to actually create and maintain their NAPTAN. You know, they're all at a different level, let's say. But ultimately, there are ones which will give you a GISS, give you a map, give you validation so you can't enter incorrect information. You have to complete all the mandatory fields and all that stuff, and it will validate the export for you to provide it to the DFT. But then it's not knowing what the DFT does with it, whether it uses every field. And then it's knowing what it outputs. And then it's a game for the people using that to know, as it's been said before, how people do it differently in different areas, you know, and what what you need to search for if you provide an API and the 10 different fields you need to put together and the variations to find out whether it's an archive stop or not. But there are tools out there, and there's tools to actually manage it afterwards, as they say, from passenger and everything else. But it all stems from what the DFT is going to do, what standard it's going to go for to begin with, so everyone knows to get on the level playing field, and then when it's going to go in the future. There's no point when you talked about accessibility before, which I think you said it was about accessibility to the website and the stability of what is produced, rather than accessibility of the data. But you can't have, you, there's no point adding accessibility to the data until you've sorted out the accessibility of the website its reliability and what standard you're going to use and then look at um, jumping up to 2.5 and what should or shouldn't be in there relative to NetX and so forth. So I think that that's sort of, yeah, it's a good point. These are uh, initial questions. That's why the two slides we put up were sort of, how do you want to send the data to us? Can we move to something like SA because it is just more secure and perhaps the right thing to use? And secondly, in terms of how we import and export the data, what is important to you at this moment? Um, those are two key questions. I think, um, oh, I'm getting in triangle. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, you, you're right, that is our main area of focus at the moment. I think we don't, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. I, I think accessibility is a conversation in itself. Accessibility of data is a conversation in itself that we should, we should park until the next one of these sessions because um, we could probably have quite a detailed conversation about that. Um, Roger, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in? Uh, yes, it's, it's just following up really on the idea of um, um, an interface that allows you to um, to see what's happening with uh, with your NAPTAN data as you're putting it in and will present you with any errors. 
I think just from a practicality point of view, it would be worth speaking to ITO World. They apply something like 40 tests um, to the data that you put in for each individual point. It'd be worth finding out from them how long it takes to crunch those numbers. Because while some of them are very straightforward, you're looking at things like stop names with illegal characters, well, that's just a string search very quick. Others are things like stop road distance. Well, now you're trying to um, do geographical relationships with a very large data set. Um, so just finding out from them how long it takes to crunch it uh, would give us some idea of the practicality there. Thank you, Roger. That's a really good point. And um, that's something that we could definitely start, start to look into. Shall we take a quick five minute break people can turn off their cameras step away from their computers and we come back for a little bit more at 25 past and we've got like just over half an hour to cover a couple of other topics that we want to bring you in and discuss with you thanks chair so i think it would be useful just to we we didn't really get any comments on the on the sftp ftp mm -hmm. Thing. It would be useful, even if the comments are, you know, we, we aren't the people to answer that question. You need to speak to our IT team at local authorities or whatever that might be. It'd be good to get some views on on where on what people's preferences are or whether an API is actually in the you know more of a priority. Because we could build a number of things, but we want to build the thing that works for most people first. Um, so any thoughts on that would be really helpful. Uh, from the systems that we're using, and this is in terms of consuming the data, um, we do a we do a regular download where we need all the data. So any machine readable format's fine. Um, we we download the CSVs, which is fine. That's that's been around longest. So um, yeah, no problems um, with that. We personally wouldn't benefit from an investment in the um, in how the data was accessed because we've got that workflow in place and it works very well. Um, Bearing in mind we established users and we set that workflow up. Um, if there was a single focus on it, it would be focusing on like features and data quality more than access. Um, but yeah, that's one one view from just somebody who's been using it for a while. Yeah, I would so echo David. That so David and Dan, sorry to to jump across. I just wanted to dive just ever so slightly into that. And um, and I think that's possibly a, a piece to pull out sideways into another session, but you're downloading the CSV files. Um, is that because historically that was the right place or because you can get all the data you need and you don't have to do any extra work once you, once you have the CSV? I just kind of yeah. wanted to, and I think again, possibly we take it off to one side. Yeah, just uh, we've been doing it a long time, and that was what was most established at the time. So uh, a work with the workflow was there, and it hasn't failed us. So there's been no motivation to move over as yet. Yeah. So a right. change wouldn't help you. And Dan, were you about to agree with that without wanting to put words in your mouth? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, we do a full download. We do a complete database refresh of that plan each time. And CSV has been there the longest and hasn't. It's very, very rarely gone wrong, should we say. I wouldn't say it's never. It's very rarely gone wrong. Um, and really gone wrong. Cool. I mean, we so go. If I could interject on that, it it may work, but Natan is one of those things where you cannot know whether it's changed or not. So I would I would I would challenge whether or not it is efficient to do a a download on the basis that things might have changed. Uh, there's there's got to be a better way of doing it than that, given that it's a three hundred meg file okay these these days you can download 300 meg very quick but um i can't believe it's the most efficient way to to interact with a nodal database just a thought yeah <laughs> but it, i mean if it's the thing that's working for somebody because that's how they're using them to develop something else would would be cost so it, it, it's we're, we're conscious of not breaking the ecosystem i guess yeah well, well then then we'll be doing it that way in 100 years I'm not, I'm not saying don't guide in a different direction, right? But in terms of the next three months, I think it's kind of, Dan, yeah. you're going to come in and then we'll no, go I think, 
I, I think that's a, it's a good point. I think if, if we had an accurate way of getting change only updates or anything like that, that'd be a, a, something we'd look into. But it's got to be a business case for it as well from a business perspective that we've got to make that investment. So it's a bit of a chicken yep. and egg in a way. So you can see both views that if, if you've got this current way of doing it and we do a whole download, 300 megs, nothing at all at the moment, we'll continue doing that. And if you do this new option, we won't do it until the last minute probably that we have to do it because actually that means us as a business has to spend money changing our process. Mm. Yeah, totally. I I get that. Um, I was about to go into a little side rant about the field that was always set to zero on a pile of spreadsheets, and it wasn't until somebody went back, they discovered it was uh, the number of air raids this week, and it had fo followed through from 1941 all the way through a spreadsheet into the 1990s, and it always it always had to be set to zero, and no one could understand exactly what it was, and it wasn't until somebody decomposed the, the entirety of the spreadsheet to discover that this was the number of air raids this week. Um, <laughs> Well, hopefully, um, hopefully none today either. Should we go over to Ian? Uh, he's got his hand up. Yeah, Thank it's just you. a quick one. Uh, yeah, quick one from a local government perspective. Yeah, what we do, we have a package that we export it. We do it via XML and do it by FTP. We don't have a problem with the FTP at the moment. So whatever the security elements you think are a problem, it's not something that's already been flagged with us. And in terms of because we're using XML, I think we're on 2.1, is it does have a change. It does have a date of what has changed. So in theory, what's been asked by Nick and others from certainly the file we produce and anybody else who uses that same software, you, you should be able to do an extract of what has changed since the last uh, upload. So that's just to let you know how we do it and what data is involved. Thank you, Ian. Um, one of the things that I would be interested in is just checking in with you as to just watching your workflow at some point so that we can see exactly what systems you're using and understand what changes would need to happen if we went to SFTP to your world. So a lot of this is about understanding if we make a small change, how much impact that 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 has across the rest of the ecosystem and getting a sense of that. Um, shall we move on to the next bit, which is talking about two, schemas? We've got two hands up. Oh, so, sorry, I can't see hands. Uh, so if we go to Lee first, and then and then Rob. We got Hi. Lee. Oh. oh, sorry, was it me first? Sorry about that. Um, so I missed the first uh, half an hour of the meeting, so apologies if I'm about to ask a question that's already been covered. Um, but, um, but I was interested in this idea of if you download um, the latest NAPTAM for an area, you don't specifically know what's changed and this idea of um, change only updates. Um, in a sort of longer term thinking, you know, our um, data management system is, is web based. So everything is stored on a cloud server and we access it through, um, through a, you know, uh, online. So. Is there an idea that eventually in the future, NAPTAN would be accessed on the fly? So the software you're using wouldn't have its own version of NAPTAN, which it had downloaded. It would simply just plug into a server hosting NAPTAN and, and be able to feed off that. So that there would never be multiple versions which you've downloaded. You, your version would always be exactly up to date because you'd be running it off of a central server. Is that is that something or is that is that nothing? I'm not sure. Um, ben can Ben can correct me if I get this wrong, but I believe with an API that's possible. But Ben, please tell me if I've got that right. It is certainly something that is possible to build. Um, what I would do at this point in time is turn the question around and say, is that something you would like us to build? <laughs> um, is is that something that would be useful to people? That that's where we are at the moment. If you tell us it's useful, we can investigate how how we might achieve it. Really, that that's where we're really at, right? <laughs> well, for, for just quickly from my point of view, I'd I'd say that any system that doesn't rely on the user having to remember to refresh or update something, anything that's automatically, like for example, if I was using Google Maps and I had to remember to refresh the roads or refresh the chicken restaurants in my area or or whatever, you know, I I'd, I'd probably end up having the wrong chicken restaurants. But if it's just <laughs> automatically 
running off of a server, a cloud server, and it's automatically showing me the latest chicken restaurants without me having to intervene, then obviously I think as a user that's always going to be better for me, certainly. You're on mute, Adrian. Oh. Twice in one meeting, this is bad news. Um, so, Lee, just because you came in late, can I just check um, wh wh where you're working, just so we can put that in the minutes? Uh, I work with uh, Tony Essex. Okay, cool. Thank you. And, and a very really good suggestion. I think, I mean, this is this is the time to get all those suggestions in because we we could just build what we think is the right thing, having looked at the situation and looked at what's happening, and we could just build a service that you know does X, Y, and Z. If you don't tell us now, we won't know about what things we need to be thinking about, and it'll just be based on our judgment, which may may or may not be right. Um, so definitely welcome the conversation and thoughts and suggestions. We're not we're not using this as a quant survey as well. Nobody said they can't do SFTP, so therefore we're going to do it. It's it is more just to get that sort of detail of of you know and have that conversation. Uh, Rob, sorry, we've been making you wait for ages and your hand's been up, so apologies. No, no worries at all. Um, I think um, both of those last two um, things that we've heard from Ian and Lee um, have suggested to me that really we need to think about this as two separate issues. You've got the data producers and you've got the data consumers. Mm -hmm. Now, the data producers are at the mercy of whatever tools they're using to produce their NAPTAN data. So anything you change, whether that's just a switch from FTP to SFTP or, or whatever, or an API or anything else, that's going to be cost for local authorities because they are going to need to upgrade their tools. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a separate issue potentially from the data consumers um, who I suspect would prefer to see an API um, because the consumers tend to be the more dynamic tech companies in a lot of cases who are happy to consume and would love to see just a means of consuming what's changed which is something that's been mentioned recently rather than having to do a full refresh of the, the data set every day for example um and so yeah just just to, to think about it in those two ways and if anything that you change to the producers you have to consider the cost of the local authorities anything you change for the consumers is is perhaps a quicker easier win potentially um just wanted to make that point that's helpful thank you uh, and, thank and, you and david uh, David Mountain. Yeah, um, I think the. I, I suppose I missed the, I missed it at the call because that's to do with deployment. But the um, I think it, it's a question of where my, where the pain points are, and and for me the pain points are more to do with data quality than they are data access. That's the focus I'd be. Uh, I, I want to highlight. Um, I appreciate we might only be talking about data access here, and happy to talk about those things there. But they are, however, it happens from the. Point of view of a large data consumer who might also be consuming trans exchange and a whole load of the data sets and at that point the size of naptan really is pretty insignificant and processing and um, it is fairly insignificant this isn't really where the pain is from our side I, I totally appreciate there might be people who are want api access to it so they can just pull out what they want very quickly yes definitely use cases around that but um i wouldn't want a lot of that access effort to go into accessing it in new ways and see no changes to, I would broadly say, data quality issues. Amen to that. <laughs> Agreed totally, <laughs> David. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, so Jay, shall wanna... we? Yeah. Sorry. Shall I share? Uh, again? Uh, shall... If you share again, and we move on to slide fifteen. This is the fun of of having somebody else share the slide, share the slides you're trying to work through. It's almost like those old days where there was a little bell to move to the next slide in the on the carousel. Um, I hope these are the right I ones. I think if we if we jump to fifteen, that should be yeah. the right one. Um, on the good news, I found the way of sharing where I don't show my whole desktop, and uh, I can still see you all, which is quite nice. There we go. Well done. At some point, well, OK, so what we wanted to talk about was the schemas. Um, and I know that we've kind of touched on this already, but uh, hopefully the slide will eventually come up and show me and oh. show what I'm trying to talk to. It's up for me. I think you need to press the presenter button at the top for uh, everyone else and it'll take you to that slide. All uh, right, I've got it. 
OK, excellent. So um, we want to test inject ing ingestion. This is for the alpha of any schema from 2.1 right the way up to NetX because we want to make the ingestion of data quality and not dependent on uh, and allowing local authorities to move on to any standard that gives them what they need. Because as far as we understand, 2.5 has the ability to hold that accessibility information. So we want to hold that information and put it out. And then also one of the other things we want to test is independent of how we've taken it in, we want to give it to you in whatever version that you want, but also be able to show when data wasn't supplied. So if, so if a local authority can only output 2.1 because that's all that they've got the technology for, if you ask for 2.5, we're going to tell you these fields don't won't have any data in it because th they haven't been able to be supplied. So you're aware of that data flow. You're aware of that those gaps in the data and why they're there. Does that make sense to everybody and is that useful to everybody? I just want to say, but back to my point earlier on, it's all about consistency, isn't it? So, you know, I think looking at schemas and ways it looks like that, I think you maybe have a, have a different view. You know, what's the what's the best database of, of public transport data we can get, and what do we need to make that database the best bit of public transport data anyway? And then we only accept data that populates that. Because if you have gaps in the data, how can a, a software developer act actively plan a new app or something like that when there might be gaps where but I haven't got this accessibility information or something like that. I totally appreciate that viewpoint. And I think the the flip side of that is the cost to local authorities of supplying that extra data. I know that some local authorities are possibly supplying this and we're currently not able to store it and use it correctly. So we want to make sure that any data that you give us is stored and is stored and, and is available. Um, but we don't we also don't want to drive anyone at especially in these times of, of, well, let's not say austerity has been around for a while. It's been around for over 10 years um, and now COVID is hitting as well. So so in these times of local authorities possibly not having the money to put the investment in, how can we make it so that they can continue to supply as much up to date data as they can and be aware as consumers as to where that is, where those gaps might be? Uh, I, I think that the key thing and the key lever that you've got as the department is that from January next year, authorities have a legal requirement to uh, maintain NAPTAN. Um, and that's the first time they've had that. And I think there's a desperate need um, in advance of that for somebody to tell them actually what they what they have to maintain in terms of you know what's the minimum data requirements mm -hmm. um and if that's the, you know the minimum for 2.1 then fair enough but bods is going to use trans exchange 2.4 and so has capabilities and expectations of, of data that that are in naptan 2.4 so i think there's just got to be some clarity about you know what's the minimum data set what's the format and what are the, the mandatory data quality requirements in effect and 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 that's that's the immediate pressing requirement for for authorities it'd be nice to hear um the practicalities of from from local authorities of moving from 2.1 to 2.4 are people looking at that at the moment and it seems achievable or are you waiting for the direction to be honest, from the point of view of LCC, uh, I think Rob made the point. We obviously uh, buy in software to do that. And at this moment in time, they can uh, output to 2.1 only. Uh, and given all the other changes that are going on regarding uh, the format of trans exchange, that won't be too high on their agenda to be upgrading to 2.4 or even 2.5. And should you get to 2.5, it's then a data collection issue for local authorities in yeah. knowing what is actually at the stop and whether it is 
um, DDA compliant, raised curb, or whatever way you want to put it, because as bizarre as it may seem, uh, local authorities, you don't actually know who's actually out there working on the street, doing the works and upgrading stops or even moving the things. So mm -hmm. yeah, you're, you're talking, a, it's quite a chunk of their chunk of work to actually go out and find what you've actually got out there in the field so I should say our perspective I worked at Lambeth Council for 10 years in the parking department and the what was on the uh, traffic regulation orders never ever looked like what was actually on the street at any one point uh, in my entire 10 years there so I'm fully aware of the the potential discrepancies between uh, what you think might be there and what it actually looks like um, if we go to Lee next and then to Tricia Thank you. Uh, I was just going to say that obviously for some for some people, for some authorities, the move or the decision to use 2.1 or to use 2.4 is very easy. For example, in our um, data management system, you literally just choose which one you want when you do the export. So I think um, obviously for others, as, as has been mentioned, they may have a piece of software which only supports 2.1. So that's obviously mm -hmm. a bigger issue for them. But I, I think, you know, I would certainly regard it as critical to understand which authorities already have the ability to do 2.4, you know, um, off the shelf, if you like, um, because of, if it's a very small percentage of people who can't, then it probably seems easier to support those that can't rather than having relying on 2.1 as a sort of fallback position to make sure you leave no one behind. Um, you know, if it's 10 percent of people that can't do it, then I, I imagine you'd probably want to help them to get up to 2.4. And take that as the basis, but just, just that's just my thought on that, really. That sounds sensible. We'll go to Trisha in a second. I just want we separate to this meeting. We, we'd like to do some um, more sort of quant analysis of of that, and we, we're thinking about a, a very small survey of one or two questions or two or three questions that we might send out just to sort of get a sense check of where we are on that. But th thanks, Lee. That was very really helpful, Trisha. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, basically say what Lee had said. I think we actually use the same systems. My system allows me to export in 2.1, 2.2 or 2.4. I just select which option. And the problem is that um, the system doesn't necessarily tell you which are mandatory for those versions. So we transitioned from one system to a new system. And I, or I knew in one system, mandatory fields were different. So actually knowing what those mandatory fields are as part of, as part of that would be really useful because it could be that, um, you know, I, I've been filling out all of my mandatory fields, but as part of 2.4, I've got one that's completely blank and then we'll need to get those all repopulated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, be, it would be a good thing for us if we could know um, and get that built into the system. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and Tony? Hi, uh, yeah, I was just going to expand on Ian's point. Um, he raised a good point about, you know, accessibility is kind of hard data to grasp, um, especially mm -hmm. sometimes when you feel like you're starting from scratch with all the works going on on the road that we don't know about. Um, when we did this kind of work in the past with Travel and Southeast, um, we, we relied a lot on the help of operators to advise what stops are accessible because they kind of know because they're using those stops daily. Um, you know, drivers feedback to them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, that work, obviously, we don't want that to be lost. Obviously, Southeast have probably got a, a starting base in terms of access accessibility to there. I don't know if it goes into TNDS at all or into the, into the national travel line system, um, but I think there's, there's there's been some good work done already that you could probably use as a starting base. So I just wanted to make that point, really, because I know, I know a lot of authorities will, will look at that job of accessibility and probably won't know where to start really especially when you're talking for like thousands of stops to go and go out and visit or survey yeah i mean it'd be interesting is could anyone produce a 2.5 file i'm not saying that anyone should be able to i'm just out of interest could anyone produce a 2.5 file if we asked them to mine's only 2.4 at the moment our system <laughs> yeah there are some that can there's at least two supplies out there that can adrian but the suppliers can, but could the authorities that are linked with that supplier? <laughs> That's the other thing, yeah. <laughs> okay. So if anyone, we use crude anyone Excel can. spreadsheet for accessibility. That's how. That's what we we went back to the dark ages of Excel. So I, I think <laughs> I think there's loads of different approaches probably developing with accessibility. In and in a in a perfect world, I'd like to think that we can find some sort of. Um, combined standard, but obviously that that's a mammoth job, and I, we're not <laughs> promising anything here. But it's certainly 
Um, we don't want to lose the good work that you've already done independently, but if we could coordinate it in some way, that would be really helpful. Um, um, Peter. Bearing in mind. Oh, so, oh, sorry. And then we're going to move on, I think. Sorry, Jay. That's OK. That's, thank you for that. No, thank you. Is it just to, for me? Um, just to point on the, the accessibility, just to remember sort of what we the approach that we took at the time of the Olympics, um, which uh, where, where this started, mm -hmm. um, the real value of it was being able to mark a stop that was not accessible uh, and had become noted for that because of some particular problem. Um, most stops are accessible or were deemed to be accessible in one way or another. But if if a stop can be completely blocked by cars very often, so the bus cannot get to the curb or whatever, that was far more important than whether or not there was a raised curb. Mm -hmm. And um, and really, the so the ability of some of these features in in 2.4, 2.5 is maybe so that you can flag the exception and make sure that journey planning responds to that. If it, it doesn't need to be turned into an exercise that the local authority has got to go and survey every stop at huge cost and whatever. So, so just to yeah. bear in mind, these facilities can be used on a, an exceptional basis and are very valuable to have on that basis. Peter, just to add a footnote to that, of course, 99.9 .9 whatever percent are bus stops. But um, we shouldn't forget airports, rail stations, etc., which have much bigger accessibility challenges. We, we are definitely looking at those. Um, <laughs> we've been chatting to our colleagues in rail who are doing some interesting surveying of, um, of train stations. There's a new bit of work happening. James, you've rejoined us. I have, but I think you've just gazumped Trisha, who had her hand up before me. Okay, so sorry, I'll I didn't feed the floor to Trisha and then steal it back in a minute. Or I'll steal it now. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say around the accessibility about bus stops, we have talked in the past, obviously it's not just the stop itself, it's the pathway to the stop as well. So the actual stop might be lovely, might have a drop curve, but it might be in the middle of the countryside and no lane next to it. So you couldn't get to it in the first place. Apologies if you've already covered that. But as I said, I did have to drop off, but I've dropped back on now. Um, so I think there's a there's a kind of border. I think it goes similar to your point, Peter, about whether, as you say, cars park in front of it all the time. There's kind of a landscape of stop and surrounding countryside, for want of a better word. Um, that, as I say, the stop can be perfect, and all the local authorities have done it brilliantly, but you can't get to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I was just going to say I really appreciate Peter's viewpoint on that. I think I think that's a really good way of looking at management by exception rather than so assume a bus stop is accessible and note the ones that aren't seems a much easier way forward for a lot of places because there's a lot less work. Um, I think that leads on to the next one as well, um, which is about how do we get feedback because we've only got a few more minutes, um, but. Uh, how do we get feedback um, from loops into the system so that we know that there are bus stops that move that might not be up, up uploaded onto NAPTAN for whatever reason. There are bus stops that need to be changed because I eh, haven't picked up anyone there for the last three years. So we well, do we still need to stop there? Um, so those kind of things. And what we wanted to look at is what are those feedback loops and how do they work? Um, are there ways for authorised users like bus operators to use NAPTAN to raise issues with a stop? Um, should we help the local authorities and bus operators work so that question stops, stops that somebody said, actually, there might be something a bit wrong here, are really visible, and who would this help? Um, uh, and are the end users that we all think about, public, Joe Public or Jane Public using the bus? So this leads into making NAPTAN data the best quality because the more people who can give input on a bus stop, the better data quality you can get because it turns it into a truly open data set. And what's the best way of building these feedback circuits in? This is a huge set of questions to ask with about three minutes to go. So um, I just to maybe... to first and then... Um, was that on on this on this topic, Roger? 
Uh, yes, it is. Um, currently, uh, what we're doing, and I imagine most other authorities as well, is uh, we maintain a, a decent relationship with our bus operators. And uh, if they have any problems with the infrastructure at a stop, they talk to us about it. Um, I think it would be very, very dangerous to allow them to feed directly into NAPTEN because then you end up with um, a database with multiple gatekeepers for any given um, area of the database. Um, And I do know from personal experience that certain operators in my area are not above trying to pull the wool over my eyes to get me to remove a stop from the database on the grounds that it is no longer used when I have seen a rival operator using it regularly with my own eyes. Um, so I think local authorities, if we're expected to maintain the NAPTAN data, we, we have to remain the gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and therefore, we should be the people that operators are talking to. There should be no access for them to simply go over our heads and flag things up in the data directly. Talk to us. I think that's, I, I wonder if there's a point around the transparency of that conversation in terms of people knowing that an issue was potentially raised against the stop and, uh, just, you know, it, it was looked at and decided, no, the information is correct for X and Y reason and having visibility of that. And we wondered if that would be helpful. Well, I can see your argument there. Um, I can also see um, an operator who wanted to be contentious um, pl- being able to play that system mm-hmm. um, by repeatedly raising minor issues that uh, that force us to go chasing after them um, so that we don't look like we're not maintaining the data properly. Um, I don't think for us personally, it would be a major issue right now, but a few years ago, I can, I can think of a couple of personalities who would have taken that tank. Mm-hmm. Mm. Should we go to Dan? Thank you, Roger. Um, Thanks. Yes. So, uh, a bit of a workflow we had a, a little while ago is so with our coach operator data, um, they sit slightly outside the bus remit. So we had a coach operator that we'd had a few new nap town stops in. Um, and I went to uh, find out who the person they to speak to to add a nap town stop in in a local authority. And it proved very hard for me as an external person to work out who mm-hmm. I need to speak to. Luckily, Gerard, who's on the call, was able to do the TFL one uh, really, really quickly, turned that around in a couple of days. It's brilliant. But when I try and get to someone from, I think it was Derby or somewhere like that, had no idea who to speak to or what job name to search for or anything like that. I spoke to the department. They didn't know who managed NAPTAN in Derby themselves. So it took a long time to actually get that NAPTAN stop created and in the usable state. And that means actually in the publication of data, it was three or four weeks until that stop was used. But actually the coach was calling at that in that time period. There's a massive lag. So I think Mm -hmm. some sort of directory of who, you know, who you need to contact each local authority uh, would be quite a good thing to have. Okay, Ooh, and we'll go that, to that Trisha. Sound a really good idea. We'll go to Trisha, and then we're going to wrap up because I'm very keen that we finish on time. Um, two hours is a long time out of your day, Trisha. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to really add to what Roger had said about local authorities being the gatekeepers mm-hmm. um, and operators not just being able to do what they want with NAPTAN, um, particularly when it comes to stops that aren't in NAPTAN where operators might want to stop. Um, we've had instances where we've gone out and assessed and said, actually, it's not safe. You can't have it. You know, one of the, one that comes to mind is um, on a bend with less than half a metre of grass verge on a national speed limit road. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just not safe for anything to stop for visibilities. But if operators are then allowed to create those in NAPTAN, then we have this whole issue of um, if there's an accident and it's like, well, it's in the NAPTAN data, we can stop there. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, okay. we do a lot more than just create the stops. We check their eligibility and safety against um, highways criteria as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Tricia. Um, Jay, do you have anything you want to chuck in? We've got 60 seconds before we finish. Um, I was just going to say thank you to everyone for this input and um, find a way, uh, maybe through Adrian, of adding any extra input, because I know there are people also who might watch the recording, adding any extra input and getting back to us, uh, especially via Adrian, so that we've got these ideas and we can start to build up potentially these little working groups or whatever we want on these 
on these different things like accessibility, um, how to ingest, how to output data, things like that, and look at those problems separately. But this has been great, and thank you all so much for your time and for your conversation and commitment. Yeah, just to reiterate, thank you so much for everyone's contribution. We didn't know if we'd be able to talk for two hours, but unfortunately we managed it, so uh, well done. Um, I think this has been really useful and we might look to do it again and maybe, I did say monthly, but maybe in a couple of weeks time um, or maybe three weeks time, I'll have to organise that with Tim. But if people could bear another one without the introductions and without the faff about what we've been doing in the last six months, we might have more time for a, a good chat. Um, but definitely you've been really helpful for us to to hear from you on, on this. I was just going to say it might be useful, Tim, to have a think about who would advertising some of these smaller working groups or these very focused working groups. I wouldn't say smaller, I'm expecting to have almost the same audiences, but we'll talk very, very focused on a particular issue. Yeah, let's talk over the next couple of days and, and work something out. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.